Today's topic is make or break moments for protest movements, nonviolence as a key factor. Um, let me introduce our experts. Larissa, send you uh, some information about them. We have with, with us today, Sreja Popovich. She's the executive director of the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action Strategies, Canvas, from Belgrade. Hello, Sreja, good to see you. Hello, hello, happy to be here. We also have with us Professor Sharon Erickson nebstadt She's a distinguished professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, and she gets the gold medal today because it's 7 a.m. where she is. Good morning to you, Sharon. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me to be on the panel. Well, thank you for joining us so early in your day. And then we have with us Dr. Veronique Doudier, Senior Advisor, Conflict Transformation Research from the Berkow Foundation in Berlin. Hello, Veronique. Nice to see you. Hi, everyone from Berlin. Yes. Um, so let me start with you, Asreja, because you have a lot of nonviolent protest experience. For those of you who don't know you yet, what is your personal protest history story? Can you give us a, a short overview, please? Yeah. I, uh, hi, everyone. I, I started being addicted to protests when I was in my student age, uh, being involved in a student and then people power movement called Otpor, which is the Serbian word for resistance uh, in Serbia. And uh, since then, I've been I've been working inside movements, outside movements. Uh, uh, after Otpor was successful, uh, together with a few friends, we founded the organization called Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, or Canvas. And uh, we are solely focused on uh, building tools to equip mostly pro-democracy groups, but recently more and more environmental groups uh, in how to build successful movements from the scratch, uh, and also how to focus on most important elements of movements that I assume we are going to be discussing today, as this was a topic in our small group, I'll just repeat this holy trinity of success, however large or small, however important the topic, uh, however oppressive or democratic the country, the movements win if they share three points. They win if they know where they are going or to have vision and can achieve unity. Uh, second, they win if they are capable of planning, both strategically and tactically, and they're more likely to win if they achieve nonviolent discipline, which is a term I use uh, rather than just the nonviolence, which can be a blurry ideological religious thing. Nonviolent discipline is a skill, and skills can be learned, taught, applied, and upgraded. And yes, to add to, the, to, add, to add to the history, we've been working with uh, a zillion, zillions of groups, like probably groups from 50 different countries. So almost every conflict in the world has been plagued by the idea of the people that they can learn something from us. We were not capable to help every time, but we, we worked with, with groups from over 50 different countries. Some of the actual, actual uh, uh, usual suspects that you see on the news, places like Burma or Belarus involved. Can you give us one example um, and name some people or an organization or at least examples for the activities that you worked on with them and what the results of these activities were? Oh, well, uh, first of all, uh, building a vision and developing a unity, which is a step one, uh, was something that we worked uh, with groups along the world where this was a religious uh, type of unity uh, connecting urban educated uh, uh, and mostly secular people with more conservative people or the Coptic Christians in Egypt, where this is a generational unity, which was the quintessential in change in Maldives in 2008. Uh, Sometimes it's racial unity. I mean, all different types of unity. Then moving to strategy, focusing on right pillars and understanding that uh, this is the way you win is actually finding the smallest uh, or the shortest cause of change between you and the change. So it's people see this as a protesting, but basically it is targeting the institutions where this is the non-cooperation tactic in a highly oppressive environment. That was the case of blocking banks in Sudan, yet another group uh, we, we, we know and are very proud to know them. 
uh, where this is working on tactics and working on creative tactics. And we have a huge passion for understanding how tactics work, how you select the target, how you build the right tactic, how you how you capitalize on tactic in terms of recruitment of the people. And there are zillions of examples of groups uh, using this toolbox across the globe. Uh, last but not of least importance, uh, we have been working with movements uh, to understand the importance of nonviolent discipline, to understand the reasons uh, behind the fact that the nonviolent movements tend to be twice more likely to succeed. And I'm sure my academic uh, panelists would be far heavier on data and far more scientifically persuasive than I can be on this, but just anecdotally speaking, uh, opposing Burmese government with guns and molotovs is choosing a boxing ring or a football uh, play field when you try to play against Bayern München. So if you want to win against the Bayern München, you would rather play chess. And this is uh, one of the reasons why, why this is so important. Very often you have this urgency of the movements to do things fast. Some of them have seen too many Hollywood movies and think that violence sometimes, sometimes work faster. But the reality is that you're picking the wrong battlefield and then you're losing numbers. The way the nonviolent movement succeed is by achieving numbers. And of course, through the common sense, it's very little people who can participate in a violent movement, whether because of the risk, whether because of the training. There are so many people who can do hitting pots and pans or non-paying electrical bills when it comes to the tactics of nonviolence. You call it paradox interventions or tactics. Um, what makes it so successful? And what are maybe some of the paradox interventions that you can tell us about? I love German language and how you translate English. This is called <laughs> dilemma actions and it has nothing to do with paradox. Okay, so uh, one of the one of the ways to, to look at the tactics, and we did a lot of, of the intensive research. Like, first of all, the passion comes from Serbia. We were really into doing cool things. And then when you put Milosevic's face on a petrol barrel and put it in the main shopping district, and then people come and, you know, hit the barrel with a bat and leave some money and have fun. And then the police arrives and they don't know what to do. This is a typical dilemma situation. Uh, dilemma actions are the very special breed of strategic looking into actions, and they show the movement things. So you go out in the street in Burma and you know you'll be tear gassed or worst, but it is one thing when you see people tear gassed and then throwing stones back, it's completely one media narrative. It's another thing if the people come out dressed up as a Disney princess, which is the tactic used in Burma a few weeks ago. Uh, you know that red and white flag will bring you to jail or, or banned in Belarus, which is why you are not coming out dressed in the red and white flag and get arrested. It is why you use red and white decorations for a Christmas tree, and then you make police bringing the decorations down from the Christmas tree. It's why you build snowmen and then dress a snowman into the red and white flag and then make police arrest the snowman. So, I mean, thinking about how to put your opponent in a lose-lose situation or between the rock and a hard place is something we work extensively on. Uh, what is really interesting, we did a research. There is a, actually, you can download it from for free from Amazon. It's called Pranksters versus Autocrats. It's a little essay I did with Sophia McLennan, the professor from Penn State. We are now looking into 300 cases. And what we figured out is that dilemma actions are completely unrelated to territory or the type of struggle. So they occur in anti-corporate struggle. Germany has a very popular brand called Volkswagen. Volkswagen was caught in a big lie about its missions in US a few years ago, the group of anti-corporate pranksters called Yes Man did a tremendous prank. They appeared as Volkswagen, did a public apology on behalf of Volkswagen, thus putting Volkswagen in an absolutely impossible situation. If they deny the communique in which they are apologizing people for lying to them, then they're looking like bastards. If they admit that they are apologizing to people, they're doing exactly what Yes Man want them to do. So it's either lose or lose. So it's not only related to oppressive situations. It's not only related of mocking dictators. It's not only related to the 
harsh man Vladimir Putin arresting toys. There was a toy protest in Siberia in 2006, known for the fact that this was the first historically known toy protest to be officially banned by the police. So, I mean, uh, it puts your opponent in a weird situation where he or she appears either stupid or weak. This is doing things in Belarus, you take a look of the you know restrictions of only five people can gather, then the six people gather and they feed pigeons. So if you arrest people for feeding pigeons, then you don't have charges against them. If you don't arrest six people for feeding pigeons, there'll be seven people feeding pigeons tomorrow. So these structurally uh, organized tactics are, are uh, relying on several assumptions. The first one are widely held beliefs. The second one is, of course, what your opponent will do and putting your opponent between the rock and the hard place. And the third phase is post-production. So starting with the Gandhi Salt March, which was the first uh, widely documented case of dilemma action, we found it dilemma actions dating back to the 17th century. So, I mean, this is nothing new. This is very universal. And using humor is very effective. But uh, more importantly, uh, the reasons why tactics work in on one struggle is that somebody's planning them. So I'm going to put it in one phrase, being pranked is worse for a dictator than being protested against. Oh, yes. It puts, it puts them in such a dilemma that they can only lose. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there are, there are, uh, we normally start our, 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 our workshops and university courses with a, with a photo of mass protests and very large red letters saying this is not nonviolent action. Uh, because people equalize uh, these mass tactics of concentration with nonviolent action. Uh, actually, the, the largest hits, the largest breakthroughs in historic nonviolent struggles came from diversity of tactics, came from, from different thinking. Uh, people see Serbian struggle and say, yeah, there was a million people on the street. No, there was a general strike in the largest Serbian mine. There was every single shop was closed due to the general strike. There were blockades on the roads. There were people not appearing on the work. There were people denying to act when ordered by their chiefs in the police and military. But what you see is a mess. So people came to this uh, large misconception that, you know, we call this phenomenon occupyism. All you have to do is to sit in a symbolic public place in a large numbers. And next thing you know, the Nestle chocolates will start falling from the sky. This is not how the thing uh, works. Uh, uh, the, the, the protests are the part and, and very wide use tactic of nonviolent struggle, but only one of more than 200 uh, documented parts. Some of them like, uh, like uh, micro targeted strikes is uh, what it really works. Uh, people uh, withdrawing their money from the state and military operated banks in Sudan and Burma, for example. So this, is a very, uh, this is a great example of recent tactics. You have junta. So you know if you go on street, you'll get killed. This is one one So you keep going on streets, you keep getting killed, the people get afraid, the less people go going on the streets, and then you are doomed. If, however, you say, okay, this is the bank through which money goes to salaries of the soldiers. So people have power to withdraw money or shift their accounts from bank A to bank B. So now you queue people in front of the bank and now you're putting the opponent in a large dilemma. First of all, it's very difficult to suppress this action because even in Sudan or in Burma, it's not uh, illegal to withdraw your own money from ATM. Second, if they ignore it, the monies will be sucked dry, the banks will be sucked dry of money. And then if you combine this tactic with a micro targeting the white collar strike, for example, was a big thing in Sudan, the people who do swifts called in sick. So there was nobody to do the bank swifts. So there was nobody to transfer money from National Petrol Corporation into the account of the military, so military can get paid. By calling in sick and withdrawing money, the movement made the, the really painful impact and actually forced the military to negotiation table in Sudan. Why? Because oppression costs money. You need to pay people to kill people. It's not, they're not doing this for fun, they're doing this professionally, if you can call killing people a profession. So taking a look at, at how you target, how you micro-target, 
all of these elements uh, matter. And this is why, once again, it's a mantra. You need vision. We know this. You need unity across the different lines. And sometimes it's ethnic lines, like in Burma or Sudan. Sometimes it's about the economic lines. Sometimes it's about the racial lines. But then it comes to planning. The planning is not let's go on the street and protest. This is not how the things work. This is not why the struggles are uh, successful. This is looking at the pillars that you can sway. This is looking, following the Sun Tzu's idea that you need to put your strong points against your opponent weak points. And when you when you follow the Twitter feeds from places like Belarus and Burma, you see why some things work, why some things doesn't work, why some tactics work. So you can say, oh, wow, we shifted from concentration to dispersion. So we have a small strikes everywhere. But actually, it's a it's strategically wrong thing. Uh, in Burma, for example, they're wasting time by trying to reclaim the streets. They own the streets. The military wants to bring them into the game of cat and mouse and kill them in the streets. But when they say, okay, kids don't go to school, that proves that military cannot govern. And because the kids don't go to school, we are organizing a large network of homeschools. So by ignoring the state-controlled schools, the citizens of Burma effectively deny uh, military both legitimacy and governability. So you have the empty schools with soldiers in front and everybody sends kids to the home schools. So it's a combination of proper targeting, non-cooperation and parallel institutions. You don't see this much because it's not that effective as millions of people marching, but this is what really works. So when you scratch around the surface of the of what we call the popular protests, you actually see that uh, meticulous planning, picking the right battlefield, strategical selection of the pillars or institutions that you want to target and combination of different tactics is what really works. Thank you very much. Some very interesting examples um, and very lively. Um, sounds almost like fun, you know, these activities. Sharon and Veronique, I've seen you nod and also enjoy the um, presentation. But from your professional background, uh, Sharon, you do mostly research. Veronique, you do research and um, field work. Um, let me start with Sharon. And you've worked on nonviolent protests for many, many years and written about it. Does what Sreja just described mirror some of your academic findings? Does it make protest movements more successful uh, if you use these um, dilemma actions? And do you find other examples that we haven't heard of yet? Yeah, the field, the academic study of nonviolence has really exploded in the last decade, which is fantastic because we have so much empirical research. It's not just going on some isolated instances, but we can really look across countries and across movements and see patterns. And uh, our research does exactly support the kinds of comments that Sergio has just made. So if you look at the movements that fail, they often are the, not doing the types of things that Sergio just mentioned. And we do have a, a great number of studies out there. Probably the best known one is the study done by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. And they looked across a whole slew of different movements across the 20th century and into the 21st century. And they did find that looking up across all these movements more often, the nonviolent movements were successful than the violent ones. So in their particular database, they found 52% of the movements that use nonviolence achieved their goals, whereas only 26% of the, of the movements that use violence were able to be successful. But I think it's important to recognize that this isn't a perfect solution, a perfect panacea to all these problems, because even though 52% of the movements using nonviolence were successful, that means close to half were not successful. And I have spent a little bit of time looking into, well, what are the factors that derailed those movements? Um, it's not that they didn't have the commitment or the, the goals, but they made some mistakes. And I think we do a disservice to a lot of people. I know I think here in the United States, when we teach about social movements, we highlight these moments, Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat, or in the Tinman Square movement, the famous photo of the man standing in front of the tanks. And people get the idea that it's just someone kind of being fed up and taking a stand. But in fact, there is all this behind the scenes work that Sergio just mentioned. And when students don't learn that behind the scenes work, they often think that all you need to do is have this dramatic moment and people will fall into the streets and voila, you achieve your goals. So we do know that that failure to do the background work 
is what derails a movement and often leads it to not achieving its goals. And we do see a number of patterns. And again, these are going to support the kinds of comments that Sergio made. We do know that unity is really important. It's very easy for movements to end up fighting each other over goals, over strategies, over leadership. I can see right now here in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement, which is so strong at this moment, there is an internal debate going on about goals. Should they be working for the abolition of police? On the other hand, there's a group that's saying that's not viable. We need actually police in our communities. How do we transform it? And so there is this debate, and that's a very common one where you see groups dividing over kind of a more militant approach or making concessions. And I see that happening right now in the Black Lives Matter movement, but you could see it also, for example, in the Tiananmen Square movement in China 30 years ago. We also know that oftentimes people aren't successful because they don't get the amount of participation that they need. So again, referring back to Chenoweth and Stefan's study, they see this as the primary factor in achieving goals. And in their study, they say, if you can get three and a half percent of the population to mobilize, that's kind of the tipping point. Now, of course, that's looking backwards, so we can't use that as a, a predicting turn, tipping point in the future, but what it does show us is the importance of participation. And it's clear that these nonviolent tactics work more effectively. They have a bigger impact if you can get large scale participation. Think about a boycott. One of the reasons the Montgomery bus boycott in uh, the civil rights movement was effective is because they had almost 100% participation of the African-American community. And so overnight, literally overnight, the bus companies lost 70% of their customer base. And you can sustain that for a little while, but they were able to keep the boycott going for a year. And eventually what the bus company had to make concessions, not because they had a change of heart, but because they couldn't operate financially anymore. So if you can get a lot of people involved in a boycott, they'll feel the loss of profits very quickly. If you only mobilize five or 10%, oftentimes companies can make up those losses. If you think about a general strike, if a few people go on strike, they're easily fired or dismissed. But if you get the whole country or at least a very sizable portion to go on strike, you can stop business as usual. You can bring the country to a standstill. So participation is really important because it makes the leverage of those tactics more effective. And we also know, of course, that the bigger you have, uh, more cross-class and cross-group um, participation you have, the more likely you are able to reach different elites. So political elites, business leaders, religious leaders, military leaders. And if you have whites, widespread participation, you're more likely to be able to get them to defect and side with the movement and support the movement. So failure to mobilize enough people is another common mistake. Uh, Sergio mentioned the importance of nonviolent discipline. And again, we can see that oftentimes movements mobilize, but if they haven't done the preparation, the planning, and teaching people the importance of maintaining nonviolent discipline, it's very easy in the heat of the moment for it to spill over into violence. And what happens then is that it's very common for the state to justify a crackdown. They can say, we have chaos, we need to impose law and order, and therefore public opinion supports the state and the security forces. But if you maintain nonviolent discipline in the face of that repression, we have this dynamic that we call backfire, that people see the crackdown happening of unarmed people, children, elderly individuals, civilians, and people begin to question, is that the kind of government we want to support? So if you resort to violence or if it spills into violence, that backfire dynamic is unlikely to happen. And finally, we know that maintaining nonviolent discipline is really important because the public is much more likely to support an unarmed group than an armed group, particularly in the international community. Political scientists have shown us that when people view a conflict, they don't like to support groups that are ethically and morally uh, ambiguous. So for all those reasons, maintaining nonviolent discipline is very important. And then I just wanna underscore Serge's point too about diversity of tactics. And I'm a little reluctant to use that term because the Antifa movement often says diversity of tactics to include violent tactics. I would say a rich tactical repertoire, that there's lots of different tactics that people can draw on. And unfortunately, so often movements think of one tactic and it is so often the mass demonstrations. And mass demonstrations are very good at showing the, the degree of support for the goals. It's very good at showing how many people in the population want change. But 
If you only rely on that, which is so often the case in movements, it's problematic for a number of reasons. It's problematic because your opponent can quickly figure out how to counter and neutralize that. If you change up your tactics, you keep your opponent guessing and they don't know what's coming next and it's hard for them to suppress it. And you have to think about it really much more like a chess game to use that, uh, that metaphor. And I will critique the nonviolence literature and academics. We so often present Gene Sharp's model. Here are these sources of power that citizens have. All you need to do is systematically withdraw them and the state collapses. And while that's absolutely true and Sharp has done more for our knowledge of understanding than perhaps anyone, the problem is it presents it as a one-sided struggle, right? This is the movement has to have this great strategy. But it isn't a one-sided struggle. It's a chess game where your opponent is also planning counter strategies and new moves. And so you have to be able to keep them guessing by using different tactics. And the other thing about relying just on one tactic instead of having a rich uh, tactical repertoire is it gets boring. So Sergio's comments about you know, the, making activism fun matters because people will drop out if it's the same thing over and over again. So having a variety of tactics is important because you're withdrawing different power sources, you're keeping your opponent guessing, but you're keeping the people engaged in the movement. And I think it's very important then the last point is to not just have a strategy for your own movement, but to anticipate uh, your opponent's counter movements, particularly repression, being prepared for repression. And so often people are not thinking of that they launch a campaign and things like mass demonstrations or occupations are actually quite easy to repress because everybody's in one central square. So you know where they are, you can go and arrest people. That's the moment where you have to have plans in place to shift from those tactics of concentration where you show how many people are involved to tactics of dispersion where maybe then you shift to a boycott where it's very difficult to know who is participating in it and it's not illegal. So you can't arrest someone for refusing to buy it some kind of product. So there has to be a lot of that behind the scenes work. And unfortunately, so often the media and historians depict movements as these kind of important moments where people stand up, but there has to be the behind the scenes work that's put in place and the strategic efforts to make sure that the movement can sustain itself. Otherwise, it, it's likely to be derailed and not achieve its goals. Thank you, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of the feeding penguins thing. You know, it's like you can't, legally say anything against it, but if there's too many people feeding penguins, that is a statement. Uh, Veronique, um, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts, and then there are some points where I just wanna uh, you know, go on further, like the role of the media, for example, but I'd like to hear you first, Veronique. Yeah, thanks, Uta. And um, maybe building on, on what's been said already from the, the part, um, let's say the particular angle through which I'm coming at this topic, um, since I'm working at the Boga Foundation, which is a, a conflict transformation organization, and hence um, my interest is to see how uh, a conflict transformation lens or peace building lens can add to those discussions around what makes nonviolent protest movements effective. And I think there's a number of, of features that, that could be emphasized from that particular perspective. Uh, I mean, the first one has already been mentioned. It's about violent preven violence prevention. And uh, I think we've heard already very, very eloquently why nonviolent movements need to, uh, to remain uh, effectively nonviolent. Um, and I think when we think about that, it's not only about, about short term thinking about why is nonviolent discipline helpful in bringing down a dictator or changing a regime or, or getting rid of, uh, of unequal and unfair policies. But it's also about thinking about the long-term impact of uh, a culture of nonviolence uh, or nonviolent discipline onto the society that is being created. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a quote from Anna Arendt, which I love, which is, the practice of violence, like all action, changes the world, but the most probable change is to a more, a more violent world. So I think what's very important to, sh to show and to maybe... Uh, uh, convince activists about is that um, not only will nonviolent non discipline help them to have more participation, to bring more unity, uh, to uh, have a positive image in the media, to uh, not give the opponent um, excuses to repress, to also get more um, people from the majority community or from the, low, the high power group on board, but it's also about what kind of society do we want to create? Um, and uh, so there's, a, there's another statistic that comes from, from the, the book by um, Schoenweth and, and Stefan, which is less often cited, 
Um, they show that actually a, a violent campaign uh, only remains, um, or let, let's say, like in, in transitions that, that follow violent campaigns, the probability of, of a civil war within 10 years after the end of the conflict is 43%, whereas in the cases of nonviolent campaign, the probability of violence is only 28%. So, so it seems that nonviolent uh, led um, tactics do lead to more peaceful societies. I think there's a number of tactics that are used and can be used by movements to, uh, to uh, emphasize the, the nonviolent nature of their struggles. And I think there's also some really powerful examples that we can draw from uh, leaders such as Martin Luther King or, or, or from uh, Gandhi himself on how they were aiming through nonviolent struggles to, uh, yeah, to not only get rid of oppressive policies, but also to, to create better harmony and reconciliation in the end. Um, I also want to emphasize again from a peace building perspective, uh, what, are the, what are the factors that make protest movements more likely to be effectively um, impactful on the transitions that, that follow. And by impactful, I mean both from the inside, you know, what, is the, what are the factors that make them more likely to be meaningfully included in the this decision making spaces that, that happen during the transition, as well as the factor that help them to influence those from the outside through sustained street pressure. Um, and so from this perspective, I think there's, there's a lot of emerging research that shows the importance um, for movements to prepare effectively for those transitions. For instance, by um, thinking very early on about, about leadership and representation. And this is something that we often hear about uh, protests, right? They're very um, horizontal nature, the fact that they are organized around the coalitions that we've heard before um, and how those factors that make them effective during the revolution actually might make them weaker during a negotiated transition. So it's about helping them to think very early on about how are we going to, to select our leaders who can speak on behalf of us, not letting ourselves being represented by uh, political parties that will claim to represent us but have no credibility, um, as well as how to prepare for, uh, yeah, for negotiations themselves, how to develop a, a positive vision of our agenda and not only a negative vision of we want to get rid of that, but actually what do we want to build, what are concrete and pragmatic alternatives, which is not sometimes a bit anti antithetical to the way that protest movements think. Um, so there's a lot, I think, that we can still learn a lot uh, about, you know, what, what are those factors of effectiveness, not only to get a, to get a, a toppling of, a, of, again, of, of a single person of a regime, but, but to, uh, to have real reforms uh, being implemented and, and materialized in society. Thank you. That actually touches upon something that Tom Carruthers uh, said in our first session. He identified a trend towards leaderless protest and um, said that that could have implications. So that's you know something I would like to uh, get into a little since I saw Sreja reacting, you know, like nodding and agreeing. So could you, from your examples, you know, after the dilemma action and the good organization of those, what are the experiences? With the transition phase, how important is actually leadership and management um, to come to, um, you know, better results once you've protested? Uh, to to completely agree with Sharon and Veronique, uh, uh, remember, fifty two percent of the movements are effective if they are nonviolent. What about forty eight percent? And then another interesting figure from uh, amazing Maria and Erica's book is that uh, when you take a look at who achieved democracy and take a look in a five-year period, it's only 42% sustainability. Why? Because that brings you to the question of all questions, which is the last part of our, of our curriculum working with movements. So why movements fail? So sometimes they fail to produce numbers. Sometimes they fail to, to deal with the oppression. Sometimes they fail in strategy. Sometimes they lose unity along the line. But history teaches us that uh, when you take a look at these three phases, of social movement, the first one being emerging phase where, where there is a problem and there is a group of people trying to do something about it. Then we move to what we call engagement phase where movement have numbers and you see visible tactics and you see protests and things of that kind. And then we get to exponential phase in terms of numbers, which is the avalanche of the people joining the movement. This is where the most movements fail. So most movements fail in the victory phase. That's uh, that's. Uh, that's like a football match where people are playing, playing, playing. When they get the penalty, they, they lose the penalty. So this is like 
this is really frustrating. Why so? Uh, because A, uh, once again, it's very difficult to achieve unity uh, when you don't have a big evil bear in front of your door. And actually seeing uh, uh, groups, uh, very different groups operating, you, you can go back to solidarity movement and see the very unusual coalition of urban intelligentsia, shipyard workers and Roman Catholic Church what that brought down the communism in Soviet Union. You can take a look at the South Africa, you can see the racial unity between the races that don't normally communicate or tribes that have been in war with each other for hundreds of years. <laughs> you can take a look at the civil rights movement and see uh, that unity along the line of north-south and this kind of stuff. Uh, that unity is very easy to maintain when somebody tries to kill you. And actually, your opponent is a very effective way to achieve this unity because if you step down from the boat, you'll be killed. and Or you will be leaving people that you're in a boat with. So this kind of responsibility wanes in a stage of negotiations, which is why you need clear demands. You need leadership. Also, very good advice we give to the movement is to elect their negotiators early. Uh, people suited to build and lead the movements with a megaphone are not necessarily the best people to broker the deal. And uh, this is also involving the third entity. We call it surrender entity. Sometimes your opponent hates uh, to surrender to you. And they will never surrender to you. But, you know, Milosevic technically surrendered to the mi Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs. So we find a guy that he can surrender to. And uh, uh, the, the, the idea behind this is that this is all part of the strategy. You anticipate the building of the movement. You anticipate the large tactics. You anticipate bringing your opponent to negotiation table. But you also need to have a strategy for negotiations. You also need to know what is the wish of these negotiations, what is the intent of these negotiations, what is the must. Sometimes in transition phase, it's very important to, import, to, to, to involve people from the former regime that was very effectively used in Serbia and places like Georgia uh, because they are kind of guarant that this is not going to to be a prolonged conflict. And, you know, as you know from life, successful negotiations are those that uh, nobody nobody is happy with the outcome. This is when you have a this is when you have a successful negotiation. It's very rarely winner takes it all process. Uh, uh, back to something else Veronique touched briefly. Uh, we are living in a very uh, different era now than we were in a time when, when we were building movement in Serbia, not only due to the fact that we have social media, which makes things uh, faster, uh, easier to, 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 to uh, spread and easier to become, to become uh, horizontal in a way, also easier to troll and easier to surveil. So every coin comes with a two different sizes. We are studying this thing, and, and there is a very interesting uh, research done by Carnegie Endowment. And actually, next week, we are opening our Canva Summer Academy, which is a series of events very much like uh, uh, this Berlin Dialogue. I would be happy to invite you to uh, with this uh, with this two sessions, one which is focusing on movements and the new age of decay of democracy, but the burst of the movements. And this is where we are going to talk about how the movements of nowadays are actually very different than, the, than, for example, the movements of labor unions of 60s and 70s. They tend to spread faster. They tend to be around the symbols or, or demands rather than the organizations and structures. Organizations and structures are hard and slow to cope with the speed of this movement. Take a look at BLM. Uh, it took a while organizations to jump on board and really start coordinating this if they can. Take a look at the Me Too movement. They're like, take a look at how long it takes the gender equality organization to figure out what is happening. And, you know, before you know it was spread like a wildfire and present across the globe. Take a look at the Fridays for Future. Uh, so this horizontality comes as a good news in terms that you involve more people geographically and across uh, demographic, racial, uh, gender lines. Uh, it comes with a unique, uh, unique feature of contemporary movements, which is the level of ownership. People own these movements more as a personas, as opposed to movements being owned and run uh, by the established organizations. But it also comes with a, with a huge difficulty in defining strategy, in defining tactics, in agreeing on stuff. Because when the 
system is very horizontal. It's very difficult to agree on things without involving all of this. This is like the company which has 10 million shareholders. And I need to decide where this company is going to go, or where it's going to go public, where it's going to acquire another company. And uh, also comes with, uh, with uh, unpredictability and possibility that uh, some of your little shareholders that are proudly wearing the symbol of BLM will end up burning Wendy restaurant and things of that kind. And thus label the whole movement as violent or, or vandalistic. So these are all very, very interesting things. And these are the, the global trends which we need to follow if you want to understand the movement. Uh, just to pick one more example, uh, you see Burma is a great example for this. We had a years of dictatorship, then we have a gradual military control democracy, and now we have a coup. So what happens is that 70% of the people, 80% of the people voted for a ruling party. So military thought that NLD, the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, is the opponent. So what they did, they put Aung San Suu Kyi in jail, they arrest vertical of the party all the way down to the very local level and thought, this is it. This is 988. You stop the main engine of change. What happened that Burma exploded? by the people who are not affiliated with NLD. Took four weeks to NLD to cope with the protests. Took, took four, four weeks to them to understand what is happening. Finally, they, they founded the alternative government and we see some structure in what the main opposition force does. Why? Because people in Burma feel like they own democracy. Somebody is taking this ownership from them. So they self-organized and, and uh, across the geography and, and professions and gender, more than half of the Burmese protesters are women and race, because you have so many different races within the country and age. You have retired mm -hmm. people, you have super young people. So what's happening is that you see more and more of this trends happening. So figuring out how to build a strategy on this type of platforms, how to coordinate activities, most important of all, how to maintain nonviolent discipline. It's actually the challenge, uh, both for academics like Sharon and Veronique and the practitioners like myself. Thank you very much. For those of you interested in the situation in Myanmar, we'll have uh, Shunli Sinzar with us, who is one of the democratic activists on the ground, young woman. I was very impressed with her when we talked earlier. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, join us next week. This was the advertisement for the dialogue, but I want to look at Sharon, uh, talk to Sharon and Veronique, and then I invite you to join the conversation. Sharon, you did mention media and that they focus like on the mass protests. Um, we also heard in one of the last sessions that, you know, oppressive states learned very much, you know, how to use social media, how to um, own the narrative after a certain point. So where, where should media look more or what kind of coverage would be more helpful for protest movements? Because I know we all like the pictures, you know, Tahrir Square, Tiananmen, Belarus, you know, we look and we see millions of people and we think, wow, that is it. And, but, but what I just heard is that there's a lot more going on in the background that we should maybe be, I'm a journalist myself, be paying attention to. So, so what is your experience? What are some of your results from your studies, observations maybe? Yeah, there's a lot of different opinions on the role of media in mobilizing these kinds of movements. And of course, right after the Egyptian uprising in 2011, people talked about the importance of the internet. This was the Twitter revolution. But in fact, we also know that that's a somewhat precarious type of media to be reliant upon using social media because regimes can cut off the internet and people can counter it. I think what we know is that the media plays an important role in terms of uh, mobilizing third party support. So people seeing what's happening, providing support for the movement, perhaps pressuring their own governments, their own agencies to withdraw support from a regime. The media plays a role in mobilizing those kind of third party observers. However, I think we have to be very kind of thoughtful about not being too dependent on a certain type of media. A lot of people say, well, social media is democratic. We can all use it, but it can be cut off. It can be used to counter. I think what's essential is to find some kind of independent media. And it can even be very rudimentary. I mean, I think of some of the earlier movements that happened before the internet was was present and in the Philippines in the people power movement against Marcos, it was the Catholic radio station that played a really important role, both in terms of conveying information to the millions of people who are involved in this, 
or uh, in Liberia, the women's peace movement also relied upon Catholic radio because it was independent, right? It was not state controlled and it was not um, as vulnerable to being cut off as perhaps the internet based social media options are. So I think what's important is to find some kind of independent way to communicate this that is, again, about planning for repression. You should anticipate that the state is going to try to control whatever television resources or newspaper coverage is, is happening over the movement. They might cut off the internet so you can't advertise this through Twitter, but people can, of course, video record things on their cell phone and text it to someone who may be able to release it. You might be able to use uh, for example, the, the religious media, because that tends to be independent, even in authoritarian regimes, they're reluctant to want to repress religious media and religious leaders because the public doesn't like to see that. There's something sacred we want preserved around that. So for me, I think it's not so much, it, we need to be thoughtful about not being too dependent on one type of media, but having multiple ones that have independent sources. All right, and I see Sreja is busy, uh putting information in the chat and Larissa always sends a follow-up email. So she will include all of that in case you're just missing it. We're keeping track of all, all the resources that are being shared here. Um, one last question to Veronique in this first round and then I invite you to join. You can either let me know in the chat or just raise your digital hand if you wanna come into this conversation. Um, Veronique, um, we talked about like the organization of protest movements and the role, the way it is organized while the protest is going on or when it starts can play a role on the long run successful transition period to more democratic systems. What are some of your findings or maybe also from your consulting, your like practical work that you can share with us? Yeah, um, so on that dimension, I mean, uh, uh, firstly, as I, as I said, um, the um, one of the defining feature of, of protest movements is that they, they don't like leadership, right? They are antithetical to the idea of, of, of having leaders representing them. And, I, and I've, I've collected a number of quotes from activists in places like Egypt or Ukraine, uh, for instance, who were saying, so an activist from the April 6th movement in, in, in Egypt who said to me, the movement had a populist tendency. Nobody could claim to speak in the name of the people. Anyone who would try to do so would get dis discredited and treat, treated as traitors. And, and, and I've heard similar things from, from, from Ukraine. Uh, in the 2014 revolution, where activists were saying that, saying that because there was there were uh, of the very diverse nature of, of, of the protests in 2014, ranging from uh, maybe communists and anarchists all the way to far right activists, uh, there, there were no attempts to come up with uh, with organized structures. And in fact, some informal leaders emerged from the struggle, but they didn't have any strong mandate. So every time they tried to claim to speak on behalf of the movement and they were trying to get into negotiation, for instance, with the regime, uh, someone would come on stage and would say, actually, no, they don't speak for us. Um, so which was highly detrimental. So um, as, as I said, I think movements um, have to think about how to translate their very horizontal structure into something that's going to be workable in the long term. Um, I think one of the one of the difficulties for movements is to keep manage to keep a right balance between, uh, on the one hand, maintaining uh, um, extra institutional mobilization capacity to keep putting pressure on the transition as it unfolds, um, but also institutionalization, which is which is very important and will be the only way to to enable actually effective uh, and, and meaningful participation, as well as maybe also playing roles of watchdogs and. Uh, and uh, and keeping elites accountable during the transition, and so it's 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 a difficult balance to be found. Probably a, non, a number of leaders of protest movements will will run for political positions or for roles um, into the in, in the in the institutions, while others will really want to retain a, a, a little independent uh, uh, character. I think yeah, the, it, what's, what I found to be very important and to be missing both in Egypt and in Ukraine was. The ability to identify individuals who, who would be seen as very independent figures that could speak on behalf of the secular and the and the religious, uh, the, po the political and the um, um, revolutionary activists and who could represent all of those at the same time. So who would be credible, legitimate, representative, have a mandate, have the right experience. And I, I loved what Soja said about the different leaders that the movement needs. Um, so fi finding those individuals is hard, but it's, it's, it's very crucial. So yeah, these are, these are just some elements around, around the thinking about, about structures um, and leadership. 